Yeah, I'm over too bossy. Uh. We don't trade softly. Uh. Welcome to In the Zone with yours truly, Anthony Smith, on a Tuesday evening. But now I am um, coming to you from the air capital of the world, Wichita, Kansas. The 316 Dub K I C T. Just too many nicknames for one city. Just call it Wichita, Kansas. Hope you've had a wonderful day today. Got a lot to get to, and I think what I want to do is I really want to talk some women's sports. I know even today some people still think, why are you talking women's sports? Well, I'm like this they're humans. Just like me. They put so much effort into what they do to entertain the masses. The last thing they want to hear is why talk about women's sports. And what I'm going to talk about is the Women's College World Series. As Florida State topped Tennessee to face Oklahoma for the Women's College World Series title. So Florida State is back in a familiar position. Katherine Sandercock and McKenna Reed combined for five innings of scoreless relief to help number three seed Florida State defeat number four seed Tennessee 5-1 on Monday night and advance to the college to the Women's College World Series Championship Series. Sandercock The Seminoles' veteran ace allowed one hit and struck out four in three innings to claim her 10th save of the year. Reed, a freshman, gave way to Sandercock after allowing one hit in two innings. She claimed the win to improve to 13-0 this season. Wow. This is more like it for Florida State. Last year, the Seminoles were the number two seed in the NCAA tournament but lost in regionals. Now, they are in the championship series for the third time in the past five finals. Sound like they have a juggernaut dynasty in the makings going on out there. It's just every athlete's dream to end their career in a national championship game, Sandra Cox said. I always knew that we could do it. So I'm just really, really, really proud of the team today. Like, I just don't think that words can even express how happy I'm just so elated to be playing one more day and getting to put that jersey on one more time. Florida State 58 and 9 will play number one seed Oklahoma 59 and 1. And I'm going to have something on Oklahoma because it's a situation that keeps rearing its head. I'll tell you about that later. Once again, Florida State 58 and 9 will play number one seed Oklahoma 59-1 in a best-of-three series for the national title starting Wednesday. It's a rematch of the 2021 series that Oklahoma won. Oklahoma looks to become the first program since UCLA from 1988 to 1990 to win three straight national championships. The Sooners have won four of the past six titles. That's what you call a dynasty. Oklahoma defeated number nine seed Stanford 4-2 earlier in the day and waited for the evening winner. Tennessee's Zeta Puny hit a solo shot off Mac Leonard in the first to open up the scoring. It was her sixth NCAA tournament home run in nine games. Florida State's Michaela Edenfield answered with a solo home run in the second. Bethany King's first homer of the season pushed the Seminoles' lead to 2 1 in the third. And Janie Kerr's RBI single in the fifth extended Florida State's lead to 3-1. Tennessee starter Peyton Gottschall Gottschall took the loss. Lady Vols ace Ashley Rogers entered the game in the fifth. The Haley Wakaser two-run shot off her in the sixth made it 5-1. It was Wakaser's fourth homer of the year. The home runs by Keen and Wakaser were examples of how Florida State gets contributions from various sources and finds ways to win. The ultimate goal when you get here is can you have everything firing on all cylinders, Florida State coach Lonnie Alameda said. 
There is no book written on how to do that. You have to go from your previous experiences, your upperclassmen, what you think you can consistently bring, how can how you can grow your young one, grow your young ones. Tennessee's Kiki Malloy, a first team national fast pitch coaches association All American, was held hitless in four at bats after being one of the best performers in the tournament. The Lady Vols, 51 to 10, left seven runners on base. We had some opportunities, Tennessee coach Karen Weekly said. You kind of knew if they got a point where they had a lead, you were going to see Sandra Cobb. She's very good. She's one of the best pitchers. You saw why tonight. So, college softball. Women's College World Series schedule. How to watch Oklahoma FSU. The Women's College World Series Championship Series is set, and for Oklahoma to three-peat atop the college world softball world, the Sooners will have to do it against a familiar foe. The number one ranked Sooners will face number three Florida State in a best of three championship series beginning Wednesday night at USA Softball Hall of Fame Field in Oklahoma City. OU, which has won a Division I record 51 straight games, reached its fourth straight championship series thanks to Tierra Jennings, whose two-out, two-run double in the ninth inning Monday lifted the Sooners to a 4-2 win over number 9 Stanford. The Seminoles, meanwhile, are 3-0 in the Women's College World Series and outscoring their opponents 16-2. The last time they reached the championship series, they lost to the Sooners in three games in 2021. That was the start of the Oklahoma dynasty. The Sooners are seeking to become only the third team in Division I history to win three consecutive Women's College World Series titles, UCLA 1988-90. So, here's how you can watch the schedule, the next works that broadcast the games and all the scores that will get you to that point. The Women's College World Series, all times championship series, number one, Oklahoma versus number three, Florida State. Game one will be Wednesday at 8 p.m. on ESPN, ESPN Plus, and the ESPN app. Game two, Thursday, 7 p.m. ESPN slash ESPN Plus, ESPN app. Game three, if necessary, 8 p.m. ESPN, ESPN Plus, ESPN app. So that's how you can watch those games. And I said I had some news regarding Oklahoma. Because there's an issue when it comes to college sports. There's an issue when it comes down to college women's sports versus college men's sports. And I am going to unwrap that article right now. Because it seems to me that when it comes to celebration and showing emotions, there is a double standard. We saw it with Caitlin Clark from Iowa and Angel Reese from LSU. All the keyboard warriors and some of the national pundits has something not so flattering to say. So Oklahoma has decided that we're going to defend how we play. Oklahoma softball coach Patty Gasso said Tuesday that she tells her players you must be unapologetic for the way they play the game with energy and outwardly celebrate their triumphs, even if their triumphs is as seemingly unimportant as a walk. Because women have worked so hard to get here, yet still get judged for those things, Gasso said. That's the way we play, and that's what people enjoy. Or you don't. You either like it or you don't. But we're not going to apologize for these players knowing the game and celebrating the right way. The Sooners have had plenty to celebrate of late. They're ranked number one 
and are riding an NCAA record 51 game winning streak. On Wednesday, Oklahoma will seek to win a third straight national championship when it plays Florida State in the final of the Women's College World Series. But on the eve of the best of three series, left fielder Alyssa Brito acknowledged the criticism the players receive for the way they play with emotion and excitement. I think we've seen so much on social media, she said. It's to the point that center fielder Jada Coleman said she stays off her social media accounts because that would fire me up and maybe just want to do it even more. Coleman, a first-team All-American who was tied for the team lead in home runs with 17, wow, a whopping 17 homers, said there is a double standard that exists when it comes to men and women celebrating in sports. She says, I really don't get it, she said. I feel like we are continuously, and softball itself, are just breaking barriers. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I feel like it's just very disappointing to see people just trying to tear us down in that type of way. Maybe not tearing us down, but just kind of making it into a negative light when you're seeing the MLB players do the exact same thing or the NBA or the NFL throwing their helmets and having emotion. Like, why can't we have emotion? We are in the same stakes as them. We are athletes just like them. Why can't we not wear our emotions on our sleeves? It disappoints me on the double standard in how the male athletes slide with things and female athletes don't. And hopefully that will change very soon. Shortstop Grace Lyons said it's never about them trying to show up the opponent. What we do is to bring passion to our own circle and it's never against anyone else, she said. So I just want to say that that's not how we play. People may take it that way, but it's all of our own joy and passion, never to tear down. Brito, a first team All-American who leads the team with an .824 slugging percentage, said that the great thing about social media critics is that you can always put the phone down and tune it out. We can't satisfy anyone, and that's not why we play this game, she said. That's not why we're here doing what we're doing, is to satisfy anyone. So I think for me, I'm going to stay being who I am and stay true to who I am. And if that passion that I have offends anyone, it's just kind of like, okay, I'm not going to allow anyone to kind of change my game. Oklahoma doesn't appear to have been affected by the critics. During the Sooners' 51-game winning streak, which dates to February 19, they have outscored opponents 420 to 49. Wow. Florida State pitcher Catherine Sandercock acknowledged on Tuesday the margin is super small when you're playing Oklahoma. Seminoles catcher Michaela Edenfield repeated Coach Lonnie Alameda's message to the team Tuesday. Pressure is a privilege. Obviously, they're a very great team, and I think that we are as well, Edenfield said. We're really capable of competing with them as long as we stay present. So there you have a look at Florida State and a look at Oklahoma on how they play the game with passion. You know, if you're going to say, let the boys be boys, let me say it like this. Let the girls be girls. Old saying goes like this. If it's good for the geese, it's good for the gander. And on that note, I am going to take a break. But when I come back, I'm going to have more on the other side of this break. So stay locked in the zone. This is yours truly, Anthony Smith. Hope you're having a terrific Tuesday.
to In The Zone with yours truly, Anthony Smith, on a terrific Tuesday evening here in Wichita, Kansas, where I am from, and I hope you are enjoying listening to this podcast wherever you are listening to it from. There is some news regarding a reunion that will be taking place coming up on July the 22nd. It has been 10 years, and a lot has happened in 10 years. Some good, some bad. But if you are a Chakra fan, you need to know this. Fred Van Vliet confirmed. Details emerged for Wichita State's 2013 Final Four reunion event. Details are emerging for the upcoming 10-year reunion of the 2013 Final Four Wichita State men's basketball team. High-profile players such as Fred Van Vliet, Ron Baker, Clea Anthony Early, and Takel Cotton have already confirmed they will be in attendance for the anniversary event, which will be held on Saturday, July the 22nd at Mark Arts and Art Gallery located at 1307 North Rock Road. The event will be held the same weekend as the Aftershocks run in the basketball tournament at Coke Arena. The WSU alumni team is slated to play Thursday and potentially Friday with the regional championship game on Saturday, on Sunday. Armchair Strategies, WSU's NIL collective, is organizing the event and is promising autograph and picture opportunities and panel discussions with coaches and players reliving their journey to the 2013 Final Four in Atlanta. Tickets will be sold through armchair strategies for $150 per person, which also includes a dinner. Other players from the 2012-2013 roster who have already committed include Dimitri Williams, congrats to him, who's also coaching at Newton, C.J. LaField, Evan Wessel, and Zach Bush. A handful of other players are still uncertain due to summer plans, but an effort is being made by Baker and Wessel who is spearheading the recruiting efforts to ensure as many players and coaches from the team are in attendance. WSU's 2012-13 team featured a starting lineup of Malcolm Armstead, Baker, Cotton, Early, and Carl Hall with a bench unit of Van Vliet, Williams, Nick Wiggins, LaField, Kadeem Kobe, Darrell Green, Ahime Arupke, Jake White, and Bush. The team was coached by Greg Marshall with Chris Jans, Greg Heyer, and KT Turner as assistant coaches. It's kind of scary to think that it's already been 10 years, Baker said. Some of those guys are still playing professionally, so they haven't had a lot of time to get back to Wichita because they're getting ready for their next season. It's going to be good to see how everyone is doing and hopefully their families can come out and make it. Reunions are always fun because you get to relive the good times, but then also catch up and see how everybody is doing. We're all busy and got stuff going on in the summers, but this is a good chance for us to break bread together and catch up. And I'm pretty sure there are going to be a lot of stories that they can share, a lot of stories that they can tell. I mean, even some of you who remember that run, uh, that's when I believe the catchphrase play angry was initiated. I believe it was initiated by the big dog himself, the original big dog, because there was another big dog that came on. But AC, Antoine Carr, is known as the original big dog, told to play angry. Uh, they did that. Uh they were a number nine seed, took down Gonzaga, which was also a number one seed within their bracket. I mean, nobody saw that coming. I mean, they knocked off some pretty good teams. And I will always say, in my opinion, Wichita State should have been playing Monday night against Michigan. If the referee just makes the right call, whether Wichita State would have won that championship game or not remains to be seen. But if the referee makes the right call on what he called a jump ball, which should have been a foul called on Louisville, 
Ron Baker goes to the free throw line, and there's a chance we win that game. We're playing Monday night against Michigan for, uh, for as they would say, all the marbles. So, we can't relive, we can't turn back the hands of time. We can't replay that play. But every time I think about that, I kind of cringe up because you can't help but think about what happened if they would have had replay to really get the call right. I mean, you got replay for everything else. Why not replay a controversial call like that? To me, what I think, I will always think this way. That whole weekend was about Slick Rick Patino and his induction into the Coaching Hall of Fame. Yes, that is my theory. That is my thought process. I have been saying that for the last 10 years. I'm not going to change my mind. Someone listening to this may say, well, I think you're wrong. Guess what? You, have an, you, have, you are entitled to your own thoughts and your own opinions. But right now, I'm not listening to you on the podcast. You're listening to me on the podcast. So right about now, the only thing that's right to me is what I think and what I'm saying right now. If you go back and watch that game and watch that call, If the referee makes the right call, the hell with Rick Pitino's induction into the Hall of Fame. If he was going to get in, he was going to get in regardless. You did, you did not need to help him win a national championship just to solidify his indoctrination into the Hall of Fame. That's my thought on that. That's how I feel about that. If, he, if you knew he was going into the Hall of Fame, win, lose, or draw, and that's why I say, yes, believe, me or, believe it or not, there is some politics involved in sports. There is probably some sports betting, some wagers going on. And everybody, I, well, maybe not everybody, but anybody, let me say it like that. Anybody can be bought. So now you're probably saying, am I making any allegations? All I'm saying is, go back. Look at the game. Look at the call. And tell me, was that a jump ball call? Or should it have been a foul call? Because anybody with a half decent set of eyes will see that the guy from Louisville who wrapped his hands around, he wrapped his arms around Ron Baker trying to get the ball, did not even touch the ball, but the referee quickly called it jump ball. Possession arrow is in Louisville's favor. Yes, let's talk about this. It's not going to change nothing. But maybe some of y'all have been holding in this for 10 years. So let's get it out. It's not going to take away the fact that it was a magical run by Wichita State that year. And you have to give everybody who's involved with that team and the coaching staff his due. Greg Marshall, Greg Heyer, uh, Chris Jans, uh, Turner. Yeah, you got to give them their credit. You got to give them their due props. And we hope to someday get back to those glory days. I think there's still a possibility that we can get back. But anyway, I went on a nice little low rant. I want to look at something else as I shift from the local scenery, the regional local. Let me get a little bit on the national side because it's still being talked about. The breakup, the divorce, this happening before our eyes, the crumbling, the downfall of Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless. So Shannon Sharp has used cryptic Instagram posts to hint at next step after FS1 split. So what's next for Shannon Sharp? It appears Shannon Sharp won't have any trouble staying busy after he leaves Fox Sports 1. Days after the news broke that he agreed to a buyout with the network, Sharp has finally said something in reference to the split. He did so with a cryptic caption he included in an Instagram post over the weekend. 
It was accompanied by various photos of him tending a garden. Went out to the garden this morning, Sharp said. Took the time to pull some weeds, making room for this season's flowers to grow. Stay tuned for the seeds I'm planting. Talk about a cryptic message. Has anyone ever seen Shannon Sharp in a polo shirt with, some, with an overall type deal on out in the garden? It's quite the sight to see. On FS1's Undisputed, the popular debate show that also includes Skip Bayless. Sharp has yet to comment on his eventual departure. However, sources with knowledge on the matter reveal that there was growing tension between the two analysts behind the scenes. On multiple occasions, that tension even bubbled to the surface when they got into personal spats live on the show. Sharp has also liked tweets suggesting the two were at odds. It's unknown what Sharp's next plans are. Among the list of theories is that he could join ESPN. If that does happen, Sharp has already received a vote of confidence from Stephen A. Smith. I don't know what his plans are, Smith said on the Stephen A. Smith show. I don't know what he's trying to pursue. I don't know what he's after. But if Shannon Sharp needs me, I'm happy to be here for him. And if that included him wanting to come on first take, the bosses at ESPN know that is something I would support. So what's next for Shannon Sharp? Only time will tell. So we will be staying tuned for the Shannon Sharp saga. Well, what I'm going to do now is, you know what I'm about to do. I'm about to take another break. And when I come back, I'll have some more for you. You know I always bring it anytime I put on the headset and get behind the microphone. This is what I do to entertain you. All right here in the zone so don't you go nowhere i'll be right back to In The Zone with yours truly, Anthony Smith. And yes, we still have some more to go. So this last segment might be a little bit more lengthier. Probably about as lengthy as the first one, maybe a little bit longer. Definitely more lengthier than the second segment. Anyway, I know you don't mind because I'm doing what I can do to entertain you and I hope you are thoroughly entertained and thoroughly informed. Anyway, the Chiefs went to the White House. That's right. The Chiefs were welcomed to the White House. Now, I'm not sure if they received such an ovation like that, but they were welcome to the White House, and uh, let's just say there were some blunders or bloopers that were made along the way, or we could say somebody fumbled. Don't go. Chiefs coach Andy Reid calls Biden the wrong president during White House Super Bowl visit. <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reid made a doggone fumble 
when he misidentified President Joe Biden during a White House event celebrating the Super Bowl champs. So he misidentified President Joe Biden just like Joe Biden made a misstep on that aircraft carrier for the Air Force graduation. <laughs> the president welcomed the Chiefs to the White House Monday to celebrate their victory over the Philadelphia Eagles in the Super Bowl. The president began his remarks by joking about the absence of First Lady and Philly fan Dr. Jill Biden. Well, welcome to the White House. Applause. He says, now I have to be careful what I say today. I'll explain in just a second. You can smile. Man, it's okay. <laughs> he says, I married a Philly girl. That explains a lot, doesn't it? Fortunately, she is overseas right now in the Middle East. <laughs> She's a rabid Eagles fan, and the way, the way the game ended, I might be in for a rough night. Jill still doesn't believe the Eagles player who acknowledged the holding penalty. But I figure if the Kelsey family can make it work with Travis and Jason, the first two brothers to play against each other in the Super Bowl, then I know there is hope for hope for the rest of us. Biden was followed by team president Mark Donovan, who then seated the stage to read. The coach was startled at one point by a very loud crackle on the PA system, but handled it well with a fast quip. Coach Reed, I'll tell you what, we're fired up to be here as a football team. President Biden, your staff, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for inviting us to the White House. I mean, then that's when the speaker malfunction happened. Mr. Mahomes, all right now. Coach Reed, everybody good? <laughs> We're really fired up. <laughs> we are really fired. Reed then drew laughs when he made a doggone mistake by referring to Biden as President Barack Obama. And what a great challenge it is to present ourselves this next year, like President Obama, or excuse me, President Obama, don't go on. <laughs> like President Biden, and nobody believed us before. Nobody believed us before, and I'm sure it's going to be that same way this time. And we come out and prove them wrong. Reed was followed by star players Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes, who presented the president with a personalized Chiefs jersey. So even in spite of the blunders, <laughs> things went well as far as the Chiefs' visit to the White House is concerned. There is also some more news I want to look at as it hits here locally. And the reason I want to touch up on that is because there is a very rabid fan base here. And right now they are kind of up in arms. I had a chance to listen to some radio shows that have been podcasted. Uh, had a chance to listen to the Shane Dennis show. And he had Mike Pelfrey on. A guy I had a chance to meet, which I was honored to have met him. And he has some things to say. 
he was kind of, let's say, disturbed by some things the way Wichita State fans actually have responded. And this show that I was listening to was on Monday. And he basically said, those of you who are, you know, basically keyboard warriors, if half of y'all were at the baseball games to show support like y'all do on social media, they would have easily had at least another 3,000 fans there in the stadium for support. It may have made a difference. But the report is out that WSU hires Washington State's Brian Green to be next baseball coach. So after announcing that Wichita State would not be going forward with former interim head coach Lauren Hibbs just five days prior, D1 Baseball's Kendall Rogers reports that Kevin Saul's next hire at Wichita State will be Washington State's Brian Green. At Washington State, Green compiled a record of 91-79, including a shortened 2020 season due to COVID-19 pandemic. The Cougars had their best season under Green in 2023, going 29-23, despite a 10-19 record in the Pac-12 Conference. Prior to taking a job with the Cougars in 2019, was the catalyst in turning around to Mexico State, leading them to a first-place finish in the Western Athletic Conference in 2019 and in the NCAA regional appearance in 2018. Hibbs was not retained after guiding the Shockers to a 30-25 and 25 record, a nine-win improvement from the previous season. Hibbs, formerly the Director of Baseball Operations, assumed head coaching duties earlier this year after Eric Wedge was fired. According to Rogers, all but one Wichita State player is in the transfer portal. That player is Peyton Tolley, a two-way player who was one of five first-team All-American Athletic Conference players for the Shockers in 2023. Green was an assistant at the University of Kentucky during Kevin Saul's tenure as a front office member of the Athletic Department for Wichita State. So what I am going to do right here now is I am going to... Let y'all know just who Brian Green actually is because I'm pretty sure this is something that as fans y'all want to know exactly who he is. And y'all have a right to know that because some of y'all are going to be paying y'all's money to go out and support this man. One of the things I will say, I was also listening to my other good friend, uh, Bob Lutz on the Bob and Jeff show that y'all can hear on KFH Monday through Fridays, 2 to 4 p.m. as he was talking to one of the guys out there in Pullman, Washington, which is basically Pac-12 Siberia. He says Brian Green is one of those guys that he is going to be out in the community engaging fan support to come out to the games. That's who he is. He is very active. And I am efforting looking at who Brian Green is. Because there is some information on him that tells you who he is. And we have it right here. Who is Brian Green? You may wonder. Well, Brian Green is an American baseball coach and former player who is the current head coach, well, no longer, he was his, now the former head coach of Washington State Cougars. He played college baseball at Riverside City College, 
Chapman University and New Mexico State University between 1991 and 1994. He then served as the head coach of the New Mexico State Aggies 2015 to 2019. In 2019, he was hired at Washington State. His time at New Mexico State Green was named head coach at New Mexico State University on July 31st, 2014. Green was about to outline a plan for how he recruits hitters, which he applied during his first season as head coach. Green was about to help flip the Aggies culture quickly when the 2015 graduated 16 seniors. But he also, but he was about to recruit 35 players in his first class. Despite finishing second in the Western Athletic Conference in 2017, Aggies was named the number one seed in the 2017 Western Athletic Conference Baseball Tournament because Grand Canyon University was ineligible for postseason play. On April 10, 2018, Green won his 100th game as head coach for, of the Aggies. He had the Aggies clicking during the non-conference schedule, winning 11 of 12 at one point. Green was able to keep the Aggies rolling, turning their hot start into a WAC Western Athletic Conference tournament championship on june 3rd 2019 green was hired to become head coach for the washington state cougars baseball team so there you have a little bit about who brian green is what he has done so now the question is can he turn around the wichita state program the reason some are up in arms is due to the fact that yes there was a nine game improvement over last year and at best, let's just say it like this, Wichita State fans are a lot of nostalgia type fans. You want to keep that Gene Stevenson tree going. You want that splash higher. I heard Shane Dennis, as he was interviewing Mike Pelfrey today, or on yesterday's show, he said it like this. You couldn't get a more splashy or higher than Eric Wedge. And how did that turn out? How does Mike Pelfrey feel about the whole thing? He says he would like to be a part of it as well. However, however, at the end of the day, he says he wants to see this program return back to national prominence, whether he's a part of it or whether he's not a part of it. And he was very sincere. He also had a ringing endorsement for athletic director Kevin Saul. He said when this whole thing went down, he said you could tell that Kevin Saul was torn with what he was about to do. He endorsed Kevin Saul as a man having a heart, a man having Christian values, but also a man having to make a tough decision that it appears that he really didn't want to have to make that decision, but he knew he had to. When asked if the Isaac Brown situation might have played a role in it, Pelfrey, being as candid as he can and also as careful as he can, he said it may have played a role in it. The only one who would really know that would be Kevin Saul himself. But what I like is the fact that whether... Pelfrey is a part of the new regime or whether he's not. You can't take away the fact that he is a shocker through and through. And his word for the fans is if you can support us you can support Brian Green. That's what I took away from the interview that Mike Pelfrey had with one Shane Dennis. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring this show to an end. I hope you have enjoyed it. I have enjoyed bringing it to you just as much. I will be back with you again sooner rather than later. But until then, always stay locked in the zone. And I look forward to being back with you soon. So until the next time, take care of yourself and each other. Be blessed. I'm out of here.